Hello, this is Vicki Matranga at the IHA. Welcome to our webinar about cookware. IHA is pleased to present this educational program with representatives from the Cookware Manufacturers Association and a well-known expert in the field. We have a record number of attendees today proving that the cookware market is sizzling. Our global market is busy buying cookware as people are cooking more at home and planning now for holiday baking and roasting. Our guests today are Peggy Rosima, Managing Director of the Cookware Manufacturers Association, who speaks with us from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Fran Grosbeck, President of Ten Touch Creative Agency, a partner to the CMA for membership and marketing. She joins us today from her home at the Jersey Shore. But before we begin, the usual notices. This program is being recorded and will remain on our website, theinspiredhomeshow.com, and will be also posted on CMA's website. The speakers have generously offered to share the PDF of their slides with the attendees. During the discussion, you can type in your questions by hovering over the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I'll be back after their presentation to engage them in conversation. The CMA, a not-for-profit trade association owned by its membership, is of, of manufacturers of cookware, bakeware, and kitchenware, helps develop engineering standards for the industry, disseminates information to consumers, retailers, and marketers, and manufacturers, and often offers forums for members to learn about the latest advances in manufacturing, retailing, distribution, and materials. Penny, CMA's expert spokeswoman, has more than 30 years of consumer product manufacturing experience, including product development, cost engineering, procurement, and international business. Industry veteran Fran Grosbeck has spent her career in the housewares world in product development and brand management for major retailers, followed by 20 years with Whitford Worldwide, where she provided retailers and brand owners with information and tools to help them specify the ideal coatings for cookware and appliances. She now guides housewares companies to develop smarter ways to market their products. Today, Penny and Fran walk us through leading trends in cookware and changes in retail channels to discuss how the category is performing. Welcome, Penny and Fran. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Penny Rosema with uh, CMA. And Fran, it's great to have you uh, coordinating with us on this presentation. Welcome this afternoon. Oh, thanks, Penny. I'm happy to be here. Great. OK, I'll let you start with the first couple slides. All right, sounds good. Well, welcome everyone. And we are so excited to be here with you today, especially with the holidays approaching. It's really great to connect and share this time together. You'll see a slide here next with our bios, our contact information. When you get a copy of the presentation, you'll be able to uh, reach out to us if you need. So this is an incredible honor for me. I just have to say this because I've been a big fan of the CMA my entire career. And uh, after being a CMA member representative for Whitford, I know firsthand the great people and great things that the CMA has done. And it's incredible to be part of this webinar today. You see the CMA's mission statement here. The CMA is dedicated to the cooker and bakery industry and all levels of the market, manufacturers, brand owners, importers, retailers, and consumers, making important information easy to access and monitoring key issues facing our industry. And of course, our members are our greatest asset, and it's an incredible team of industry experts working together to keep our industry moving forward. For more than 88 years, I love that number, the CMA has offered market intelligence through our reports, the Import Export Report, Commodity Report, and more. We provide these reports that analyze our member shipments and import records for cooker and bakeware and to all segments of the market. I'm now going to pass this back to Penny to walk you through the latest data. This is a fun way to give a presentation, passing that baton back and forth. Thanks, Fran. So let's start with um, looking at the cookware market. We're going to give you a bunch of statistics. And we're starting with uh, cookware, the total cookware category. There's going to be two blue boxes here. And one thing I want to point out to you so that um, those of you that are joining at the last few minutes, these pre the presentation slides will be available to everyone that's registered. And there's going to be consistency in the next few slides. The blue boxes are by third quarter. So it's just third quarter uh, data and what the percent is for that category, whether it's up or down and appropriate arrows. The bottom blue box 
is year to date. So January through September, and this is gonna be consistency, consistent over the next few slides. So if we look at co total cookware, and I'm talking about aluminum, stainless steel, cast iron, porcelain on steel, the whole cookware uh, category, it is up third quarter by 36% or a little above that, and year to date by 20%. Now, if you graphed, and, and, and all of these slides kind of follow a pattern, if we graphed it, um, the percent changes since January of 2020, it would be, as often you've heard in the economic side, this would be a V curve for most of the categories. They took a drop the first quarter and then have been um, on the uptick most quarters after that for most categories. There are a couple of exceptions. And for example, the this particular large category of cookware was down 9.8% at the end of March. But let's start looking at some deeper dives. We're gonna to go to aluminum next. The aluminum category that I'm talking about here, again, if you're looking at the slides, I'm gonna to point to the left-hand corner. This is aluminum that is cast aluminum and hard anodized aluminum, and it is both nonstick and uncoated. Third quarter is up by 55%. Year to date compared to 2019 through September, it's up by 31%. It started uh, the first quarter uh, results were minus 4.9%. So again, that pattern of it started out with a drop and think about what happened, you know, the uh, end of February, part, first part of March, we had the um, shelter in place. There was, you know, some confusion on what was essential stores could be open. And so um, a definite impact to our industry, but a nice recovery. The next slide that we're gonna look at is the aluminum that is the other side that is not hard anodized and is not cast aluminum. So I know that's a little bit confusing, but I wanna remind you, you will get a copy of these slides. So don't, uh, don't get too worried about how fast we're going. But also note that this slide is talking specifically to uncoated aluminum cookware, all right? And it was down in the third quarter for just third quarter and was also down year to date. Um, it started a smaller downtick in um, March, but this is one of the examples that isn't following the, the V um, uh, uptick after the, you know, after we've kind of caught our breath. The next slide is gonna be aluminum cookware that is coated with PTFE nonstick. All right, that started out in March. At the end of March, it was a negative 13% for the first quarter. Second quarter started to turn up. And then again, third quarter, we're at 39.6%. Overall year to date, January through September, compared to 2019, this category is up 22%. Again, I'm gonna point out, it is aluminum cookware that is not hard anodized or cast, and it is PTFE coated, so a nonstick coating. So aren't you curious? What happened to ceramic nonstick? This category hasn't had um, as great of an um, uptick on it. It did start dramatically down um, first quarter. Uh, so actually third quarter is kind of an improvement of not being down as far. Um, year to date is down 29, almost 30%. Um, that covers our aluminum category. I would like to flip now to talk about stainless steel cookware. Stainless steel cookware started out March about a negative 3.8% and it had increased. It was uh, a negative still in the second quarter, but third quarter is up by 16.8%. So a nice rebound and year to date, it is at 3.4% um, to the positive. If you're curious about how the breakdown is of stainless steel, we have that on our next slide. Stainless steel year to date, this is very, you know, high level information. Uh, multi-clad is, the uncoated multi-clad is down, the impact bonded is up. Multi-clad nonstick, the impact bonded nonstick and the single wall are all down year to date. Now this is where I, I wanna stop and just take a pause to remind anyone that is a member of CMA these slides, are, of course, are available to everyone, but they'll also be available on our uh, CMA website. But members, we provide even a uh, deeper dive into information, and that's available on the website. You log in as a member. You have your own username and password. If you have any trouble with that, reach out to us. We'll help. 
And um, once you've logged in, there's a menu bar and it says reports. So there's the statistical reports, import X reports, and a, and a number of other um, helpful reports. Now, if you don't happen to be a member, but you're very interested, reach out to us. Uh, send an email note to info, I-N-F-O, at cookware.org, and just put um, membership interest in the subject line. We'll reach out to you, you know, as soon as we can. And we'll follow up with you, give you information that we can share. If you want to become a member, obviously, we'd be happy to talk to you. But this was the recap of our stainless steel slide year to date. But we do have other metals that we also keep track of. This category is what I call miscellaneous metals. We group together cast iron, porcelain on steel, and copper. And this category has held strong. While it did have a slight downtick that by the end of March uh, by about 3%, it's gone up every uh, month since then and is doing extremely well. It's cast iron porcelain, so they're very, they're very popular right now. Um, I don't think that's probably a surprise to anybody from the retail side that is in the cast iron or porcelain on steel or copper um, markets, but a uh, good category, very strong, and we are excited about that. Uh, what about bakeware? Let's talk about the bakeware category. Quarter three for 2020, bakeware is up by 19%. Doesn't this kind of make sense? I mean, Fran, we've talked about that a little bit. Uh, baking has been kind of a fun hobby, and you're going to talk about this a little bit later, too, about how even younger uh, cooks are getting engaged with uh, the bakeware category. Yep, exactly. It started down in March, similar to the other ones, three, four percent um, to the negative, but has been growing back, getting, getting its, catching its breath and, and back on the uptick every since. Um, bakeware for year to date again is 16.65 percent. This is comparing to the same time period in 2019. Let's look at tea kettles, another category that we track. Tea kettles had a little bit harder start, um, but they flattened, you know, their um, while they're not the huge gains in the third quarter, like some of the other ones were, um, they are overall year to date up, which is a very pleasant 19.5%. And um, we can provide more information and details on, on that to our members or people that would like to potentially be members anytime. Um, we also report on import exports. So we're gonna cover a couple of highlights on the import side. So private label and imported cookware shipments were down in 2020 over 2019. China is still the major producer. In our import export report, we break it out by HTS code, I think they're calling it now, you know, the, the codes, and then by country. So the, the top five countries in each code on what's being imported, that's helpful information um, often for as you're um, working as manufacturers. Uh, in the first nine months, imports were down by 1%, so kind of flat, but down by in units by 9.4%. And it kind of tugs at your mind thinking, okay, wait a minute. Many of those categories were up by significant numbers, and yet the imports are showing down. Short answer to that without a deep dive into it is inventory, right? Um, there was a complete slowdown the first quarter and some of it ran into this part of the second quarter. And then we have some great US manufacturers. So um, lots of combinations and lots of um, reasons and no deep dive here on what those are, but that's what's going on on the import side. And of course, um, COVID-19, we all witnessed had a significant factor in the downward pressure for those imports. Going forward, our trade agreements, tariffs, um, retaliation, retaliatory tariffs are all going to continue to be factors um, causing a little bit of uncertainty as we navigate into the first part of 2021. Now the video link for this as was mentioned at the beginning of this presentation will be available give us a couple days to get that reel um, fixed up and it will be on the IHA website but it'll also be available on the CMA website along with some great podcasts that you would find there, whether you're logged in as a member or not. So don't be afraid to be adventurous and um, check out both IHA and our website for additional information. Let's do and talk about consumer preferences. Now, I know it's just dying in your mind. You've wondered what are the consumer preferences, preferences along the lines of aluminum cookware? Let's look at a graph of that. Penny, this is... 
Penny, this is Vicki. We have yeah. several questions asking about these sales figures. Are you talking about the US market only or worldwide or some segments of countries? US market. Thank you. Sales revenue based on the US market. That's a good one. Thank you very much, Vicki. So we're looking at aluminum cookware year to date. Um, percentage wise, what was in stamped PTFE nonstick aluminum versus the, your hard anodized cast aluminum. There is an asterisk on that line because it does include coated and uncoated. So um, we don't separate the um, hard anodized cast aluminum category. We bunch it together. And then the aluminum ceramic and the aluminum uncoated gives you an idea by material and coatings where and what is popular. So what about stainless steel? Let's look at that one. Multi-clad uncoated, you got your impact bonded and um, nonstick, there's your ratings by category type. The multi-clad uncoated is the leader. Probably not a big surprise to those of you in the retail side as well. Now let's look at bakeware and what is the preference by material for bakeware? You have carbon steel, you know, between carbon steel, the aluminum uncoated and the um, nonstick, you know, you got kind of a, a third, 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 not really entirely that way, but um, some helpful information for you as you prepare as retailers for your um, strategy sessions. This information is great. And Fran, I hope they find this information helpful, but I want to say, wait, there's more. You're going to give us some additional details that I'm sure the listeners are going to be excited to hear. I am. Thank you, Penny. I am excited to cover this. This I've titled The Pivot Factors, and I'll explain why. Recently, one of the podcasts that you just referenced with Peter Giannetti of Homeworld Business, he described the changes in our industry and the responses to these changes as pivoting. Since speaking with Peter, we see this everywhere in relationship to the, ch the changes we're facing. It's the key to many of the changes were already in the works and they were needed. They were just sped up by the pandemic. So the question we keep getting asked is, are these changes permanent for the cookware and bakery industry specifically? So in this section, we're gonna take a look at the trends that emerged in 2020 and what will continue. Key trends that will continue working from home as we're all doing right now, probably <laughs> the majority of us, increased online shopping and increased interest in products with a health and wellness connection. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Industry update and the need to pivot. So when you talk about pivoting, there's another buzzword emerging with a different spin. It's a word we've talked about before and that's omni-channel. Omni-channel and pivoting are like the buzzwords of the day. We just highlighted the need to pivot and why it happened. And this goes hand in hand with the idea and importance of an omni-channel presence. The rise in online shopping does not mean the end of brick and mortar in this case. And that was a debate many years ago. In fact, now due to the pandemic, consumers still relied on brick and mortar for order pickup systems to get the products they needed. So if not going into the store, they were still using these order systems and they're tied to the brick and mortar experience and are as critical as the online shopping component. So it all needs to work seamlessly. As people had to stay home, work from home, go to school from home, find ways to entertain and relax at home, the kitchen became a focus of consumer spending. April and May saw a surge as people replaced old products and they added tools to their kitchen lineup to create the perfect meals at home. During these months, due to stores being closed, slow shopping times and other obstacles of the pandemic, consumers took what they could get. Now, as we head into the fall and looking forward into 2021, consumers are re replacing some of those products that they bought at the height of the pandemic. And now they're looking for quality, durability, and performance. They always were, but we had to take what we could get for a while. And they're willing to pay a little bit more for the right product, but if the product doesn't deliver, be careful, the consumer won't return it to tricky time. Drivers from the pandemic, which will continue to impact spending on home products, include buying new cookware and bakeware to replace old pots and pans, undergoing a facelift for your kitchen, um, enhancing a remodel, creating their desired cooking experience, or building a creative cooking space. Risk aversion is still high, and you touched on inventory levels, Penny. Inventory levels are still going to be very carefully planned. And there are challenges that, that retailers are still facing and manufacturers, and we are still facing high levels of unemployment. 
At the same time, consumers will have extra spending, extra savings rather, from what they didn't spend earlier in the year. I love this fact from NPD. NPD data calculated that consumers saved $145 billion from not spending on sporting events, concerts, and other live events. There's also what they saved from not traveling. So this and many lifestyle changes that were made as a result of lockdown forced consumers to evaluate the range of spending habits from pre-COVID times and from beauty to entertainment to travel, consumers discovered what they now feel was maybe wasteful spending and saw as a result of quarantine that these services or products weren't necessities. I'm gonna throw myself under the bus here. My nails suddenly became not a necessity. <laughs> and, but these dollars are shifting. Um, they're shifting to products focused on wellness and enhancing our home environments for both personal work, kitchen, your dining room, outdoor spaces, home offices. It's all now we're looking to create uh, better environments for ourselves and home. So now in this section, I'm going to throw it back to you, Penny. I like this baton thing. <laughs> we'll review factors that drive demand. So Penny, back over to you. Um, you have to unmute, my dear. <laughs> There we go. Sorry about that. I know better than that. All right, factors that by demand. You got the household. Uh, and, and what I really wanted to say about this in general, and then we'll go on to the next slide, is that there are five factors. I don't think these are any big surprise to people that are um, watching today. We've talked about them with every um, presentation that I've been doing. And I know um, Hugh, my predecessor, was the same. We track these in general because they're, they're good kind of um, yeah, they're just factors that help you understand what's going on in the market. So let's go on to households. That's our next one. Um, the household, U.S. households increased um, greater than we had anticipated them. If you look at the second bullet here, it says uh, it's up by 2.37 million. Well, last year, the Census Bureau estimated it would be 1.5 or 1.4, 1 1.5 million up by this time. So the COVID has had a significant impact on residential real estate market. Again, probably most people are familiar with that. But I do wanna mention that um, it's important to note spending habits, you know, the hardship from COVA has not impacted or it has not been distributed evenly. You know, the job loss is concentrated to lower paying industries. Uh, you, you also have the travel industry that's been affected more than some other industries. So. The other point about this um, households and, and where people are living is that attraction to urban living took a hit with this shelter in place orders. Um, people, you know, were, are stuck with, at first nothing was open from a restaurant and then limited seating, um, large sporting events, your concerts, nightlife, you know, all of that changed. So people were feeling constrained and, and were heading out of Dodge. Not to mention that now they're working from home. So all of this has, has affected the household, the real estate, the construction um, market, the home construction market, and the remodeling market. But let's look at, I believe my next one is home construction data. This is new home constructions and the permits in September were up by 1.5. Uh, that's 2.7% higher than it was in September of 2019. And interestingly enough, the median price of new homes is up by over 9%, just barely over 9% at $326,000. Again, it kind of surprises you when you, you know, are, are driving around the community and COVID and, the, and all of the changes that are going on. And then all of this new home construction, at least in my community, there's a lot of new home construction going on. And again, it's based on where people's income level is. And we'll talk a little bit about new home sales or existing home sales next. Let's go to that slide. Previously, I talked about that V-shaped recovery. So here it is, um, a visual uh, on existing home sales. The reason, and this information is coming from, I've got to remember where I pulled this from, Home Builders Association. I can't remember which one I, which resource I had on this. The um, reason they're giving for this uptick is it was low in April, it dropped dramatically, lowest levels it says since 2007. And the reason was good buys that are available. So lots of um, good offers out there and then low interest rates. Let's go to the next slide. Again, what happens in the home for remodeling, construction, new home sales impacts your cookware, bakeware buying decisions. 
you don't want to put that old set of pots and pans out in that brand new kitchen. I mean, that just wouldn't be right, especially if you're um, really interested in, in uh, you know, showing it off when you can have guests in um, appropriately with uh, the COVID restrictions. But the remodeling market index, if you're not familiar with it, is similar to the purchasing index. 50 is neutral. All right. So anything that's above 50 says there's a lot of activity. And this information is put out by the National Association of Home Builders. That index for the third quarter, as you can see, is up dramatically, double almost. Well, not quite, but what it was from quarter one. So it was 48, which is a little, you know, under average, the, the 50 mark. And then it just continued to grow. So people are remodeling, they're building new homes, and they're buying new homes. Let's go to some general economic trends. Another um, item that we've tracked for years and um, give you the updates on at these, these webinars. It's mixed again. You know, you got unemployment, which is high. Uh, gasoline, at least where I live, is, is rel relatively cheap, at least for, compared to when it was, you know, almost $4 a gallon not too many years ago. And interest rates are low. So it's a mixed bag. We're going to start by looking at the University of Michigan's economic uh, uh, consumer sentiment index. Let's try that slide. That was a tongue twister. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. Um, confidence tank, because kind of no surprise. But what I thought was interesting, and Fran will be covering some more trends as what, what to expect going into the holiday season further on as well. But um, there was more focus on lifestyle last year, right? Themed parties, travel, um, you know, those were, were big things that I, that I heard about at chess and at, at some of the other IHA events. Um, it, there's a little bit of a shift in that. Some of it's still important. We talked about the, the health, but um, generally speaking, consumer confidence has tanked. And as we can get out of this COVID fright and the virus, I expect that as everyone does, will be on a further uptick. Let's look at unemployment. 6.9%. Last year at this time, it was 3.5%. You know, dramatic changes. Again, it didn't hit everybody the same. There are those that are working so many hours, they would love to have a break. And then others that are struggling because um, their income is just, you know, they just, their employment options have, have just disintegrated. Now, the flip side of that is the employment rate. And again, that's your drop, dramatic drop. Um, it's coming back a little bit, but right, we're all going to be affected by um, how quickly the virus vaccine comes. But what's really more important, it's kind of the bad news out of the way here now. Fran, what can people expect for holiday spending? Ah, so Any we're going to see, actually, we do. Um, the holiday, um, uh, first, I want to touch on something before we get into the numbers and talk about the holiday shift, which was a big buzz for several weeks and it's going to be for a while because the move of Amazon Prime Days from July to October prompted many retailers to offer special offerings and it's no longer Black Friday a single day or even a long weekend it's now a holiday shopping period there's one commercial running and it shows like a five-week block of the calendar and it's just going to be Black Friday prices so this particular pivot to the pandemic has created an early start to the holiday selling season and then one that we see staying, the pivot provides consumers a longer time to shop, reducing pressure and anxiety from the holidays and who can't use a little holiday spirit a few weeks earlier this year. Um, there will be less spending on holiday travel and Penny, you just touched on this, the experiences from uh, last year, it's now gonna be, so there's less spending on that holiday travel, gifting of travel or even restaurants, which is kind of going out experience. But those dollars are expected to give online shopping and at-home food spending a boost. So with that less focus on experiences, there's more, fo more focus on spending on actual products and gifting. So the data you're going to see in the next few slides is from another one of my favorite resources. I've mentioned NPD and Home Rule Business. Well, National Retail Federation puts out some fantastic reports about the holiday. I'm sure you're all aware of them. But if you aren't, there's a great slide at the end and we give the links um, there's more than even just this report. It's wonderful information. And this information on this, um, the following slides, um, the consumer plans to spend $998 this holiday gift giving season. This is down a little from 2019, but up from 2018 and still above the five-year average. Now, please note, I have seen other reports showing up with a 
a little bit higher spending average than the 998, but they all hover around this thousand dollar mark. And the overall picture is that the consumer is ready to shop. I love this slide because it shows you how the dollars are broken out between gifting and non-gifting. And if you see both non-gifting categories are either at or below the five-year level with the increase being seen in gifting. And this could be representative of a greater focus on what is needed or perceived as truly important following the pandemic experience and this desire to give more to others. The trend towards online shopping will continue, of course, as we mentioned before, but department stores and discounters showed up on this survey and they'll see their share of holiday shoppers. It's great news. And, and I love the fact that small businesses showed up there too. Here we see driving factors for consumers with sale or price discounts being most important, followed by quality of merchandise. I think I've said quality now about 15 times through the presentation. <laughs> During the height of the pandemic, we saw many uh, companies or retailers pull coupons or other discounts, bring them back. The consumer will be looking for them to return this holiday season. It's a big factor for them. Gift cards. Gift cards show up as the number one gift. Um, for the season, as it always has, you can see the numbers from last year to this year. It's funny though, it is evolving a bit. It's contactless shopping has led to contactless gifting. The gift card was always popular, but it will continue to be popular as people want to avoid stores, ease of shipping or other restrictions and shutdowns that could be coming. Um, look for programs where you can suggest gifts to purchase with the gift card, take it beyond the gift card itself or for special discounts or ways to further engage the customer. So as a result of the pandemic, there are three elements consumers want most. And this needs to translate not just across product and merchandising, but also how they shop. It's, it's a package deal. Those three things are normalcy, connection, and safety. A return to some sense of normal is at the top of everyone's list. We've all talked about the new normal, but Joe Derichowski mentions in his new NPD article about the holidays and the now normal. And I love that because that's what we have to all start to accept. There is a now normal. And either way, they the consumer wants to live their lives and feel somewhat normal again. So from products to promotions, any vehicle to help simplify their shopping experience, deliver products that provide real value and benefit to their lives, it's top of their list. Make this holiday season feel like past seasons as much as possible to bring that normalcy to them. Be connected. People want to feel connected more than ever in their lives, virtual events or gatherings or limited social distanced events at home are one way they're doing this. But if the product can bring connection to their lives, this is a big win. Smart home products are one of the categories to watch here. Last but not least is safety. Safety and cleanliness has been at the top of everyone's minds. I saw before we did this presentation, there's even a holiday ornament and actually a whole series of them out there decorated with masks and hand sanitizer. So while it's a funny example, it, safety is a real concern for many and providing consumers with the safety precautions that you're taking, not only in your stores, but also for the actual products production, they're buying and ordering through the facilities you manage, everything. People want to feel safe. They want to need to feel safe. We are going to see a ripple effect of these three topics for a while, even as we start to come out of the COVID era with the hub, with the home as the center, a new um, segment emerged to stay, pay attention to. And then, of course, there's always the other factors that drive demand that um, we've mentioned some of them earlier in the presentation, but my, my cookware or bakeware is worn out. Um, I need a pan for a specific recipe, uh, the kitchen remodel, updating the existing kitchen, or even just buying a new stove because you want the cookware and the bakery you put on or in the stove to be new and, and fresh. Or you want to try a different material or construction, which we saw with the rise in cast iron numbers. So these, these demand factors still apply. Home cooks, we've always seen two groups, one that looks for ease and convenience and the other that sees this as a hobby or even a passion and they look for new ways. It's a way that they explore and relax and they really get into cooking as an outlet for them. But the pandemic introduced, and again, it was a pivot because it forced them, uh, cooking to a younger generation, having to fend for themselves while learning virtually at home if their parents were essential workers and they had to go to work. This younger generation began to cook it's an up and coming segment in the Gen Z arena to pay attention to. Also young, single and ready to mingle virtually, of course, products that help prepare simple one person meals are something to watch. 
Just some quick information from the home world business forecast. We mentioned this in our resources as well. The 22nd edition was just released. Over 78% for cookware uh, consumers that were sorry of consumers that were surveyed said they were somewhat likely to extremely likely to purchase cookware in the next 12 months, and 73% for vapor. But here's one of my favorite notes. For the study on cookware, consumers indicated that an impact driver on their purchase decision is where and how the product is featured, endorsed by a chef, used on a cooking show, featured on social media, or in a video on the internet. These elements combined represented 52.4% of the driving factors. That just blew me away after all this time in cookware. And of course, I've thrown one mention here about nonstick coating because people who know me know this is near and dear to my heart. The desired feature for nonstick pans still holds top at 40, almost 47%, the nonstick properties, but second now is high heat resistance at 23%, and metal utensils is now at 13%, and I feel this indicates that shift in attention in a different level of safety. So now we're gonna talk about some other general trends. We've talked about health and wellness in past presentations with the CMA, Healthy eating took a little bit of a hit during the pandemic and challenges to get groceries, lockdowns and other factors made eating healthy really difficult at times. But we saw a new evolution in health and wellness because of the pandemic. It's now about complete health. It's not just about our physical health, it's about our mental and spiritual health as well. And consumers are looking for products that enhance their lives, reduce stress and anxiety, and it's a new realm of wellness. I don't think cooking and bakery can't be part of that. If they're passionate about what they're doing, they want that newest gadget in their kitchen to help promote that. We also talked about in the past buying online and picking up in the store. It's now also evolved into buying online, picking up at the curb, or I love how the EU says it, click and collect. As we search for goods, we wanted to reduce our exposure to others. Um, and this format has become critical. It's reinforced the importance, again, of that brick and mortar working together with online shopping. It's not a battle of either or, it's now how they can work together to make a better connected experience for the shopper. Real value is so important to the consumer. All products have to provide a value from the price tag to the function. Value must be found in all purchases and just loading something up with 27 different functions is not how you achieve value. The value has to be meaningful. They are willing to spend more in some cases, but the value must be there. Functional products are changing too. It's not just a lower price product that you're grabbing like any potato peeler to go home because you decided you wanted to make the special re recipe. They want the functional products to also have design and be in well-known brands. And sustainability, this is not just about the product. It's a growing group of consumers that want to know the whole footprint of their product from the manufacturing components to the packaging to the stewardship practices by every company involved in the production and shipping of the product. These consumers will pay more for these products and see this as an investment in the bigger picture. Another place we had to pivot was entertaining. It took on a new look. Virtual dinners with family over Zoom, socially distanced backyards, barbecues, where everybody stood six to eight feet apart, date nights at home making use of all kinds of outdoor spaces. Even if your garage wasn't converted, you're using your garage as a gathering spot, all drivers to more home purchases. And for the last two slides about data, what matters to consumers, I love these two slides, it's all about quality and performance for cookware as well as bakeware. That's the key message that has to perform now. It's not just about price. Price at certain levels is a driver, but you really have to make sure your product performs. So before we get into questions and answers, from the previous, I wanna to touch on the CMA a little bit because um, I'm still so excited about doing this. <laughs> so we wanna make sure you knew about all the resources available to you. And we are working hard to help all members of the cooker baker industry access the information you need. For retailers, a group, I put you at the top because you're near and dear to my heart and we have a range of tools. Here you see our buyer's guide and information is power, especially when buying or developing hard good products. It's always the questions you don't ask that come back to you and we're, help, we're here to help you know the questions to ask. There's also a great section on our website dedicated to retailers and there's other tools there to help. 
And of course, our most important tool is the CMA engineering standards. The CMA engineering standards are a result of an absolutely extraordinary voluntary, I must stress voluntary collaboration among the member companies in the US and Canada. They exist to promote the welfare of the cookware industry and improve its service to public. The standards are currently uh, are continuously updated to reflect changes in materials and technology. And I believe we have three standards in review. We're always looking at this. We're always working on this. It's one of the most amazing things to witness how we all work together on it. And really great news. <laughs> if you want to order a copy, it comes in both hard copy and PDF. If you order the hard copy, you get the PDF also, but a price change is coming. So now is the time to get it. And if you order before December 15th, you're insured to get the 2020 price. We wanted to throw that out there because we realized we don't know what it's going up to. So it's a good time to grab it. But going back to the free resources, this guide to cook and bakeware is also on the website. And it is an incredible tool for anyone to access about what you need to know about cook and bakeware. And then, of course, the podcasts we've mentioned a couple of times. This is three of our most recent, and we conduct these monthly podcasts with key industry people. We've had a lot of fun recently doing these, and there's been some amazing information. It's available on all platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart, and more. And, of course, on our website, you'll see a podcast section. If you are interested in becoming a member, you can contact us following the webinar or visit our website, cookware.org. And here are those slides I mentioned about resources. So the first one is a link when you get this in the PDF in the digital format, these will be active links and you will get this link to this fantastic section of the National Retail Federation Winter Holiday Reports. There's a few other, you see the one right here, Holiday 2020 by the numbers, another good report. And of course, our friends at Home World Business, such a great um, an important asset to our industry. This forecast is relied on year after year. 22nd annual one is out. If you haven't seen it, go to their website and definitely get it. It's worth looking at. And last but not least, our amazing industry partner at the IHA for putting this together and letting us be part of this. It has been a fantastic experience and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Thanks, Brian. That's great. You want to open it up to questions? I can. Um, yeah. I, 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 you know what I realized? I forgot one thing. I forgot one thing. We're going to be back in April. So, so tell your friends. <laughs> We're going to do this each spring and fall, and uh, we hope we can do it more with the IHA. But we will definitely the, the CMA will be hosting another one in April. Well, thank you both to Fran and to Penny. Um, you really covered a lot of ground. And uh, the, question and the question screen has been popping. So um, I, I you covered a lot of questions that came up early. You, you mentioned them later, um, but we do have a, a few that um, perhaps you could com comment further upon. Um, first of all, uh, several questions were about the, whether your figures were for the US market only. Now, I assume um, you said that this was for US consumer sales figures, is that correct? Yes, U.S. figures. Yes, that's correct. Okay. For the U.S. market. So when you when you addressed imports, that um, it suggests that you were discussing um, imports to the U.S. and yes. that you were addressing U.S. manufacturing in that right. comment. Right now, some of our uh, manu U.S. manufacturers also export to other companies or right. other countries. So we do collect that data as well for our members. But um, I don't cover it here because uh, it's not as relevant for the retail side. Okay, so um, one of the questions was, um, why do you think ceramic coated cookware sales have been down? Well, you know, um, Fran, I'm going to have, I'm going to reach out to you as well. My, because I, I had a chance to see that question ahead of time. Um, everything was kind of down originally with the COVID and then stuff has rebounded. And, and quite frankly, for the CMA, we always put the nonstick into one category previously. So this is the first cycle that we've actually separated both of them out. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I don't have a quick answer for it. Preference would be something that would come to mind, first of all, but I'll let Fran, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. I will preface it by saying, I think ceramic coatings have a place in our industry. They've carved their spot out. One of the challenges with that particular data, could it have had anything to do with difficulty in getting goods uh, during COVID? You know, there's so many other factors that we're just, we're up against um, that were 
never seen before. The only other thing I can wonder is there is there was an overpromise by the early uh, people who introduced ceramic, and there was an expectation set that was not realistic to that technology. Um, not sure if that has anything to do with it and that some consumers, the shift to, could could the uptake in cast iron have come from the ceramic consumers? I'm not sure. But again, there's so many factors that come in here, but I still do believe it's a viable and important category. But um, could also be, there, there was a, a, sense, a statement once a couple of years ago at the Chicago Houseware Show, someone said to me, the three to five year blues is ceramic where, you know, a consumer is, abusing it or overusing it and you lose the release property and they get a little disappointed. So could they be switching to something new? Um, but again, I'm not putting down the category. I think it's an important category in the, in the market. We just faced some different factors this year. Okay, now we have a couple questions on uh, the way your data is aggregated. In uh, one question, it goes to anodized versus cast aluminum. And the, spe uh, the questioner says, these are lumped together. Um, can you refine that to give a sense of whether the anodized is down and the cast iron is up? I can't. Cast iron on stick? We, 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 we um, collect it as a, as a group. Um, our members just recently reorganized the different groups and, and how we reported it, and they asked for those just to be lumped together. So I don't have any finer detail between the two. Okay, the other one is similar. Do you have cast iron, copper, and porcelain on steel together, or is it possible to get data on each material separated? Again, we only, at, we only um, gather it as a group, that okay. miscellaneous metals group. We don't separate it out. All right. Um, you, now, you mentioned that this was for U.S. Uh, consumer sales, but one, one um, uh, attendee is asking if you have any general idea on the trends for South America and Europe. I don't. I don't have any information on that. Um, Fran, I don't know if you have any past experience if that if they trend the same. I don't have I don't want to answer for you. I can't speak to South America. That's a, a different it's a it's there's differences there. Europe it used to be very different. We saw some more similarities over recent years, but I don't have data on it. Okay, well, you did address the issue of price sensitivity versus performance. So uh, that, that came out pretty loud and clear. Um, a couple of questions related to sustainability and health and wellness. It was great that you said we're looking at, at health and wellness as a, as a larger issue to include mental and spiritual health as well. But perhaps you could refine a little bit on sustainability and health and wellness. Sure. Um, for sustainability, it really is, you see companies that, that are dedicating entire teams and divisions to ensuring sustainability of their products and their practices. And um, it's really something to pay attention to. You have states that are making major environmental movements. I, you mentioned I live in Jersey, Vicki. We just passed a law at this last election. There will be no more plastic bags throughout the state. It's gone, done. Um, yeah, it's a big step for us. And um, this is the kind of things, it's a hot topic. They wanted to know that the product they're buying is safe, but it's also, like I said, contributing to that bigger picture of taking care of the earth and doing what's right for the earth. So, and it's not just the packaging and the product. They want to know that you checked the resources it's coming from. They want to know that whole footprint. And then when you talk about wellness, all those products, they want the sustainability too, but it really is it's like they want the product to act like those meditation apps. <laughs> they want the, they want the, the, the experience to bring something to them, and it's not just the function of cooking. It's not just the function of ma finishing making a meal. It's the whole experience. That experience we talked about, where people were traveling to get it, now they're getting it right in their kitchen, and it's a whole. <laughs> If the product works, it brings value, it functions like it said, and they get to enjoy the experience, they can't ask for more. Great, so then that would relate to one of the questions here. Do you think it still makes a positive difference to show the end consumer of all the value chain, even if the product is manufactured or imported from China? Read that question again. 
Um, do you think it still makes a positive difference to show the end consumer all of the value chain, even if the product is manufactured or imported from China? I'm not sure how to answer that. I'm well, not sure how I would answer that. I would say this. When it comes to sharing information, I'm going to speak from the marketing perspective right now. You sometimes have to draw a line between giving the entire piece of information because too much information can be as deadly as no information. But definitely shorten it. Make a statement that shows that lets them know you paid attention to this very timely topic. It does not have to be the entire chain of command or, you know, a whole document on your website, but let them know you're paying attention to this important topic. And sometimes keeping it simple is just as powerful. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one um, listener said that uh, uh, she loved the NRF slide on the 2020 where consumers plan to shop. Um, so perhaps uh, you can uh, further refine that and talk about direct to consumer website impact on the industry and you did mention the impact of Amazon Prime Day and, and no Black Friday so um, social media obviously and and um, various websites have a huge impact on, on every business uh, maybe you could give a little more detail there sure Penny you want me to field this one on direct to consumer? you bet <laughs> so for direct to consumer we've seen this uptick in these really incredible sites selling what they present is the ultimate tool for cooking. And each one, it's so in, it's so wonderful to see how each one has their different approach to it. No two are alike in color or construction. And what's great about this group, and it reminds me about the CMA members, they're all working towards that same goal. Let's get a cons the consumer's really good product at a, at a good price. Um, the interesting part about DTC though, it hasn't, it hasn't knocked into the um it's been more of a it's a good promotion vehicle for our industry it's actually enhanced to what we do instead of taking away from from someone else and they're showing us they're leading the way in how to pay attention to these very important trends and topics ex especially around safety and environmental issues well then we have a couple of uh, questions on uh supply and demand for fall trends. So I'm glad that you referenced uh, a report that you have uh, that uh, available on your site. And um, we were hearing as early as April about the worldwide shortage of yeast as people were drawn to fulfill comfort food needs by baking all over the world and bakeware flying off the shelves and impacting your, your supply um, your inventory of, um, situations. So uh, one of the questions is, um, as we head in what is often the Olympics of family cooking with all the baking that is expected at Christmas and, and Thanksgiving, uh, one question is what are the cooking or baking trends emerging and how that will impact uh, what and how the consumer buys. That's a good one. It is, and, and I'm gonna let you answer it, Fran, but one thing I wanna um, mention um, was our fall meeting and the uh, put a plug in for Michael Wolf and his um, Smart Kitchen Summit. Um, if people haven't heard of Michael Wolf, just uh, do a um, Google search and it's just like it sounds like the animal. He has podcasts, he has a lot of information they're talking about. Now, not so much about the cookware and bakeware, but he does talk a lot about um, the types of food and um, what do they call the meat that's not... Oh, like the Impossible Burger. Impossible meats and, uh, and all kinds of other different trends that are going on that. So that's just a hint for listeners on one aspect, but Fran, I'll let you, you know, talk some more to it. We are totally on the same page. He was the first person that popped in my mind. And for those of those attending this webinar who have not heard about Michael Wolf, I got introduced to him through Penny. Phenomenal presentation, phenomenal resource. Um, it, he touches on cooking trends, but of course a cooking trend then tells you what cooking tool they're gonna need. Um, one of the things that I see continuing to grow, and I think it, it, it's not going to go anywhere because the pan just serves the juice that way, but in bakeware, the larger cookie trays functioning as savory cooking, doing these one pan meals, you know, you can make, you can toss together the ingredients for a fajita, put it in the oven, and in no time, you're cooking just as fast as you would in some of these, um, toaster ovens or air fryers and stuff, you get you don't get as many functions as the air fryer ovens, but you still get this control. And one of the advantages 
especially for people of large families, you can put multiple sheets in the oven at the time, in the oven at a time and produce more food. So it's fantastic. Um, I think on, I think there's a lot of things coming in small appliances too. I think there's some great tools coming out and mm -hmm. it's all about, I mentioned this before. So whether it's cookware, it's a bakery piece or it's a small appliance, make sure it achieves a function, but beware of overpromising and saying 27 or 30 functions because <laughs> you lose them after about five. <laughs> so yeah, they ha those functions have to be real and provide a value. But um, Baker always sticks out with me. And the one thing we're gonna watch because sets we saw come back up during COVID times because people were buying a set to kind of repop, they open their cabinets, they're like, well, we need more cookware than I thought. But the year before we were seeing a trend back to open stock, is that shift gonna happen again? Or are we gonna maybe take a split where sets still have a presence or is it smaller sets? You know, for years, the 10 and 13 piece set drove our businesses. Is it a five piece set? Is it a four piece set? Is it something where there's a handful of really useful pieces together that could be termed a set, but keep them a yes, yes. similar, similar to the tableware market and, and how the 16 piece set turned into a three piece or a five piece set. Hey Vicki, um, I want to answer um, one oh, sure. in, in here that was asking about, um, was glad to hear that plastic use is going down mm -hmm. so much of it, they pay hours, you know, getting people to unwrap. Um, I, I like the fact that someone's talking about this from an engineering or from a CMA standpoint in our engineering teams, they have been constantly for the last couple of years pressing on um, shipping and reaching out and making yourself vocal to the carriers. Oh, so I'm talking UPS and FedEx and those people. You, you'll, you can find um, videos on YouTube where the boxes are being transported down lines and they have no guardrails. And so boxes are falling off, which means the engineer has to further package that product so that it doesn't damage the inside where guardrails on the packaging lines would, would solve a lot of stuff. It would be less packaging and um, just makes a whole lot more sense. So people need to start being aware of that. We're communicating that out to our resources, but I'm so glad that, that someone asked that question about packaging and how to um, reduce it down. If you get a chance to be vocal with your um, shippers, um, do that, that they have adequate uh, facilities in the warehouses. Yes, and with the COVID situation, the packaging, of course, is, is catching up with a lot of people that right. individually wrapped items everywhere is, is, a, is more, more difficult. Um, now, I, this might be addressed to Fran. Uh, from a marketing standpoint, do you think it makes more sense to prevent, present first the product's benefit or the experience that you've talked about um, just a couple of minutes ago. So that's where the recipes and the appearances on social media, I'm sure come in. I love this question. This is a really good question because the experience is definitely, benefits are great. They have to mean something to the end user. They ha So giving your list of, a, B, C, D, and the benefits is fantastic, but what does that mean for them? What's the experience they're gonna get from that? What does it mean to their lives? It's just like we talk about in business, you know, that the features and benefits. We have to now translate that to the experience. I love that question. So personally, marketing, the way I've been leading my marketing team is experience first. Benefits are so important, but it's the experience and then it highlights the benefit. So I love that question, whoever asked it. <laughs> And then um, to the topic of smart products, as you mentioned uh, um, and, and raved about Mike Wolf, IHA knows him well because we had, um, he, he helped us out in our smart home pavilion and spoke at, at, the, at, the, at the show several times. And one um, listener added in, uh, he does have a newsletter um, called The Spoon and the, uh, the address is very simply thespoon.tech. So you. Um, you can find him that way. I'd also insights. like to say thanks to Stacy Reed. She did a little shout out for, um, you know, the, the shift uh, for women in this industry. And thank you, Stacy. We are thrilled to be uh, leading the CMA charge and appreciate your, uh, your comments. 
Well, if we're going to start talking about gender, that's a big issue. And we should also <laughs> note that although women are considered the, the chief purchasers and users of housewares products, men are definitely stepping up in the cookware department. It goes both <laughs> and, ways, yes, doesn't it, Vicki? That's right. And men's preferences, men's preferences and the kind of performance they require out of their products are sometimes different than, than um, what, what females are going for. And then our so, younger audiences, too, right, that another person commented yes. on that um, besides what Fran had said about the, the younger girls group that and using it so we got to look at all our demographics right that's right that's right well i'm just scrolling here through the questions to make sure we covered everything we've had a, a really let's say sizzling audience here interested in everything you're you've been attending to um and i think we've we've got everything oh here's one that we missed um while percentage of growth is important can you share where the larger dollar growth or declines have been that may no. be a category split question again. <laughs> no, I can't. I, I, I don't have that information at my fingertips, but um, members who are part of our organization and um, report their data to us to help us you know, gather all this do have a deeper dive into what's happening in individual categories. So you know, that's just uh, the benefit of a membership. Okay, well, we should, we should close it up here pretty soon with one last question. So with all of this discussion, what do you think has been the biggest lesson from COVID? Oh, uh, be prepared that's a lot. Change. <laughs> be, per be prepared for change. Don't that's be right. afraid of change. Um, and know that some of the changes were just sitting there waiting to happen. <laughs> yeah, and that's true too. And that's I, and true. I heard this um, phrase of, you know, we had order, disorder, and then reorder. We don't throw everything out with a bath baby with the bathwater, right? There are some things we, th you know, certainly brick and mortar is not going to go away. I'm, Fran mentioned that earlier, but it's that combination getting, getting better at that omni-channel thing. So yeah, I think it, we're in a disorder for a little bit, but that reorder is going to be even better. Yep. And with, with people spending more time at home and with families, it's likely that the, the cooking habits will, will have a longer lasting impact on children and families for Agreed. Co cooking together and baking together. Vicki, it's been a blast. Thanks a lot for asking us. Well, thank you very much again to Penny and Fran. Um, uh, to our listeners, please keep up with both of them. Their information is on the screen. Um, they'll be happy to uh, ask, uh, answer your further questions. As we said earlier, this webinar will reside on IHA's website, theinspiredhomeshow.com, and will soon appear on CMA's website as well. So on behalf of IHA, this is Vicki Matranga. Thank you for joining us today and stay safe and have a great week. Thanks, Thanks everybody. You. Bye.